the ship is the largest moving object devised by man. Great liners, cargo ships carrying everything from oil to grain, warships of the world's navies are all driven by the screw propeller, but this was not always the case. Before the screw propeller, the steam-driven paddle engine plus sail was the accepted means of moving ships. In 1787, an American, John Fitch, harnessed steam to two sets of oars, similar to this model rowboat. Although not successful, the potential to defy nature using steam power fired the imagination of the entrepreneur. In 1789, a British engineer named William Symington developed a steam-powered marine engine which he installed into a paddle boat, Charlotte Dundas, of which this is a model. The large paddle wheel was driven by a double-acting cylinder of 22-inch bore. She was capable of a speed of 6 miles per hour. She worked for a short time on the Firth and Clyde Canal. It is generally acknowledged that the Charlotte Dundas was the first successful paddle-propelled steamship in the world. Paddle steamers began to appear in the early 19th century. They were fitted with side lever engines to a single paddle wheel at the back. Robert Fulton carried out a successful steamboat trial in the United States. The stern wheeler became a familiar sight on the rivers and lakes of North America. Compared to sail, paddle steamers were easy to manoeuvre. They were not at the mercy of the wind, although when docking care had to be taken not to damage the paddles. The paddle steamer was not at home in rough seas. It had the tendency to roll, causing one paddle to submerge while the other rose out of the water. Also, as the ship's coal was used, it got lighter, affecting the depth at which the paddles were most efficient. With the arrival of steam power, the Navy were under pressure to adopt the paddle engine in their warships. However, the Admiralty were sceptical. At the time its fleet consisted of large wooden sailing ships with sides bristling with muzzle-loading guns. The preferred method of engagement was to sail in close to the enemy and fire off a broadside. If steam paddle ships were used, the Navy feared that a direct hit to the paddle wheel would render it immobile. Secondly, the space required to house the boiler and paddle wheels in the centre of the boat would mean less space and fewer guns. This attitude didn't change until the arrival of the screw propeller. Early screw propellers had met with little success. Then in 1831, a farmer named Francis Petit Smith built a small spring-driven model boat using a screw propeller. He tried it out on the village pond at Mill Hill in northwest London. Also at this time, a Swede, John Ericsson, patented his version of a screw propeller. In 1839, the first screw propeller ship was launched, the Archimedes, soon followed by the Robert F. Stockton, built using Ericsson's screw propeller in the United States. They later went on to introduce the screw propeller on two warships, Smith's The Rattler in Britain and Ericsson's The Princeton in the United States. In Britain, Francis Petit Smith was a major champion of the screw propeller. Trials had shown that efficient propulsion 
could, however, only be achieved if the propeller were driven at speeds higher than those required by paddle steamers. However, engines of the day were slow turning to suit paddle operation. The screw first developed by Ericsson Smith was not considered viable until the development of the compound engine and iron hull. The wooden hulls of the day lack the rigidity to withstand vibrations from large steam engines. Only the world's navies could afford wooden steamships due to the frequency of major repairs. The navy's interest in the Archimedes persuaded the Admiralty to build the Rattler, a steam-driven sloop, to prove the viability of the screw as opposed to the paddle. A test was organised. Two naval vessels were coupled together back to back. They were the Rattler and the paddle steamer HMS Elector. At a given signal their steam valves were opened up. The Rattler dragged Elector astern at a speed of three miles an hour as the Elector's paddles thrashed ineffectually in the opposite direction. Brunel wanted a ship that could carry passengers leaving the Great Western Railway at Bristol and travel all the way to New York, USA. The Great Western Steamship Company was formed in 1836. At the time, a limiting factor in steamship operation, both here and in the United States, was the amount of coal or wood it had to carry in relation to the distance it was travelling fuel taking up valuable cargo space. For many years, long journeys required steam power and sail. In 1837, Brunel launched his ship, the 1,320 ton wooden paddle steamer Great Western. In 1838, a competition was held between the Scottish built Sirius and the Great Western to see which one could cross the Atlantic the quickest. It took the Great Western 15 days and 5 hours, 3 days and 5 hours less than the Sirius. The significance of this event was that both vessels were under continuous steam power, although the Great Western had to use her sails in conjunction with her paddles, they proved to be not so efficient in ocean conditions. Brunel realised the limitation of wooden construction and the stress caused by the vibration of the engines. He decided to build a new ship of iron. It would incorporate the largest paddle wheels ever built, but after witnessing the demonstration of the propeller-driven Archimedes, Brunel decided to change the means of propulsion from paddle to screw, using new engines based on a design patented by his father. Brunel's new ship, the Great Britain, was driven by a chain belt connecting the engines to the propeller shaft. The revolution in steam power to drive ships is now history, overtaken by the diesel engine and nuclear power. The propeller, however, is still going strong. Once a familiar sight around our coasts, the paddle steamer has all but disappeared. A sad reminder of those days, this ship, the Ride Queen, once owned by the Southern Railway, carried hundreds of people between Portsmouth and Ryde. She was withdrawn from service in 1969. Since then she has led a chequered career, only to end up like this. Luckier than some, the Medway Queen is undergoing restoration work by the Medway Queen Preservation Society. The members are determined to put her back into service. Built in 1924 at Rochester, she operated around the coast. Originally coal-fired, she was converted to oil in 1938. At the outbreak of the Second World War, she was converted to a minesweeper. During the evacuation from Dunkirk, she saved over 7,000 troops from the beaches. Old England has repaid her. Her 
treatment is a national disgrace. Although the bombs of Hitler couldn't sink her, her country's own indifference took their base. Let's save the Midway Queen, let's save the Midway Queen. Don't let the breakers smash her up, let's put her back to steam. She's earned a place in history, don't let her die in shame. Give all you can and lend a hand to help us sail again. Give all you can and lend a hand to help her sail again. Happily, there are two very fine examples of ships that survived the propeller revolution. Kingswear Castle, built in 1924 for service on the River Dart, is Britain's only surviving coal-fired paddle steamer. The second survivor is the world's last seagoing paddle steamer, the Waverley. Built in 1946 in Glasgow for the London and North Eastern Railway, in 1974 she was taken out of service. That same year, the Paddle Steamer Preservation Society bought her for £1. In 1975 the fires were lit and the Waverley moved out of her dock to continue the story of steam power and the men who made it work. <laughs>